Hi, gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to start. Uh, most probably the worst possible uh, slot on the day when everybody has already eaten and is sleeping, and I need something uh, to keep me awake. Uh, and we also will have some uh, competition there from the back of the sponsor. Okay, this is for ZFS. I'll give you some real life uh, information. And firstly, I'm going to explain what ZFS is, some of the concepts on it. Then how I also use it in VMs and in real life for my clients. It's just a quick rundown, the introduction, what is ZFS, some of the concepts that you need to be aware of, real life deployments, and you can do some Q&A and I can show you a few things. Most of the fun stuff I will be handling in the workshop on uh, Wednesday. Who am I? I'm Andrew Kuzaj. I'm a freelance consultant. And I fell in love with this while I was doing a large uh, Solara system administration in other countries in the world. Historically, I used Solaris on zones and their live upgrades. Live upgrades is a way where you can do changes to or busy upgrading a running system, and all you do is you just do a simple reboot into the new environment, and you have a running system. With all the new patches, just the reboot away. I also used it to transfer lots of terabytes of data from uh, Oracle on Solaris to Oracle on Red Hat Linux at the previous uh, company that I contracted for. Currently, I'm using it at home for my own NAS. The only reason I had to reformat those drives uh, is for the simple reason that I used it on Solaris, which at one stage the proprietary diverged from the open source, so I had to format it to get back to the open source versions to be able to continue my open source based uh, network there. Today, I'm running it inside VMs. I'm running it on my prop hypervisors, and I'm running it on Postgres on bare metal. So what is ZFS? The quick and the short answer on ZFS is the copy and write, volume manager, and file system of lots of extra things on it. There are some links that you can follow up. You can look at the Wikipedia on ZFS if you want to read up on the history and stuff on it. You can go to OpenZFS, where most of the development in the open source world for both FreeBSD as well as the Linux has happened. And if you want to run it, you want to run it with ZFS on Linux. So that's mostly where I will be focusing my stuff on, is the ZFS on Linux. That's the first part where Linux where the ZFS actually becomes part of the kernel and not inside a fuse. Right, we have two main commands for uh, ZFS. The one is the zpool command, which you manage your pool devices, the management of the devices underneath it, and then the ZFS itself, which is your file system, your volume management type commands that you are using. It. That's the one that you do some uh, your settings that you will mostly use. The other you can just be aware of, they are not the ones that you will typically use in day to day. It's a top two that you will need to know as a system administrator. ZFS's focus is and was always on JBox. It's not meant to run on hard right? it's not meant to run on SANS, it's meant to run on a bunch of disks where you can manage those disks and let ZFS handle that for you. The general assumption there is that you have lots more uh, uh, CPU and cheaper CPUs than you can have on a hardware rate system. A hardware rate system's biggest problem is that uh, and is it, uh, it's expensive thing to do, it's expensive to embed those things, and then it gets to the point where when you need to fail those disks to another system, you can't because the hardware rate controller doesn't work on the newer things, and you can't get the hardware rate controller that can handle those disks and stuff. Whereas with ZFS, those disks should be readable by FreeBSD, uh, Linux, as well as Solaris. That's the emphasis on it as long as the pool standards are being sorted out or are compatible. Right, let's have a look at the type of devices that you can use for uh, Linux. Up for ZFS. 
The first one is your mirrors. So that's, you all know that. It's a disk that's mirror copy of the other one, of the next one, of the next one. With ZFS, you can have it in one, two, or three way. Okay. One thing to remember, you can't shrink those mirrors. You can only grow them in size as you grow the devices underneath it. Then you have your RAID Zs, comparable to RAID 5, RAID 6, RAID 7, where you have one, two, or three disk uh, redundant set. Uh, the one thing it does fix is the RAID 5 uh, recovery hole, is when you have a disk that failed in a RAID 5 uh, setup, you do not know when you recover those uh, blocks from the other disks, if any of those other disks had some problems on it, whereas RAID uh, Z will be able to tell you because it does checksums of that. That's one of the nicest things of the RAID Z setup. Again, you can't grow the or change the underlying uh, where is it, format layout of those pools. You can only add extra VDEVs, or you can grow the devices inside the VDEV and grow the VDEV that way. You can also not shrink it. That's one of the gotchas with uh, ZFS, unfortunately. One of the nicest things with the ZFS is it's keep track of where data has been written and what data has been written. So when you do a recovery or a shrub of your uh, Pool, it will only shut up and recover those that were actual device data. It won't go for the rest of the stuff that's not being used. I've mentioned you can't change the pool sizes, you can't shrink it, you can only add devices. The one fun part on this is it forces you to beforehand sit down, decide what you want to do, where you want to go, and plan from there. It's also easier when you do your grow your uh, volumes that you look at the number of disks that you're going to go in initially, spec it according to the allocate of what is it, the optimal sizes that you want to do for each of the V pool of the V devs, and then you grow that way. Rather than uh, have everything up front and want to shrink when you need to, rather start small and grow and add as you continue with your Z with your ZFS. If you want to shrink, the best way there basically is do a ZFS send receive. Another gotcha on ZFS is the sizing, the minimum sizing that you need to write to disk. It's designed, what is it? It's managed by the A shift. Whenever you create your tool, you have you can specify the allocation size. And that's then the size that you will be the minimum block size that it writes to the disk. In the older days, we have our 512 kilobyte, uh, what is it, byte, uh, alpha K block sizes that you write to disk, which is quite nice and small, and you can do lots of fun things with that. But as disk grew, the actual wastage on the disk is the reason why we have AF, the advanced format disks today, and we have minimum block sizes of 4K on those disks. Do know that once you write that 500 byte to the disk, the disk will actually, in real time, read that sector from those 4K sector from disk, modify that 512 bytes, and then write it out. You don't want that. That's one of the reasons why you need to make sure that prepare for those disks in future by using the H of 12 when you create your pool in the initial start. Also be aware for your 8K disks on your SANS that does, of your SSDs, that does the exact same. You have the same fun apparently in your AWS uh, ECBs where you have 8K block size there. The ZOL. The ZOL is the intent lock for the ZFS. It's the part where it actually tells the, or stores information that is going to write this synchronous data out to disk. It's only used for synchronous writes, like NFS shares, database commits, iSCSI type things. It's not used for the normal data that's being written to disk. You can force it on or off, but do note the ZOL is not a cache. When you do have these high synchronous data Rights like you have of a database or iSCSI for NFS, 
That's the part where you then want to have the ZOL separate from the actual uh, storage. Usually, like your, most of your other journal file systems, the ZOL gets written to the main storage. When you need, use the S-log, that's a separate uh, device that you then write the intent to. It's a very small one. It's only the intent that's being written to the ZOL log, not the actual data for longer uh, caching. The advice there, it's a five second period or 10 second periods, depending on your DX group sizes that you have. And if you look at the usual five seconds, one gigabit of data that you consume, gigabits of data you need, 0.6 gigabytes of uh, data for the ZOL. Anything more than that, you'll be wasting space on the ZOL log. The other important thing is the adaptive replacement cache. That's the actual buffer that ZFS handles for the disk. It's a very interesting thing that it takes two parts, uh, the frequency of data being, of the blocking access, as well as the recent use of that block to decide whether it's going to cache it or not. I per VDEF for the assumption that my underlying storage has already have all the RAID-Z stuff, so I don't need to do RAID-Z there. There's one uh, trade-off for putting the compression inside the VM. Uh, the problem on that one is, is you do not have necessarily all the threads available inside the VM than you have outside of the VM on the uh, hypervisor. So it's a little bit of a trade-off there. I prefer it inside the VM for my Postgres and those things for the backup features that I have on that. So I then just extra provision my those VMs with extra threads. On the hypervisor side, the compression I use there is LLE. For the simple reason, as I said, the stuff is already compressed inside my VMs, so I don't need to do that. When you have uh, VMs that do not make use of ZFS, then you can enable the compression on those. Then you will have the performance and the benefit for those VMs on the, uh, that side. One thing to remember there is synchronize your Zivo record size with the A shift inside the VM. That way you have a similar size as it gets written from up to down. Statistics, Munin. Let me show you some of my Munin stuff. This is a Postgres database. You can see the size there. It's about, uh, for today, it's in the vicinity of 300, oh, was it 210 gigs there. If you look on the actual storage, that thread there is the database. It's using 70 gigs. So it's nearly a three to one compression ratio that I get on my Postgres database. That's on the SSDs, so I actually also get the performance benefit that I get the speed of the SSDs times three to get from my database data read in and into RAM. The blue parts there, that is my snapshots that I have of the database. It actually helped me one day. I actually deleted my Postgres database on that server. All I had to do is roll back the snapshot to the last snapshot, and from my uh, replica, I are synced the differences back. And I could start up my database. I think I transferred 10, 20 gigs versus a 200 gig database restore. Who want to like to do that? So yes, ZFS did save my bacon. Uh, there is the ZFS arc. This is a client where the database grew to the point where it actually, the indexes was so big that caching it in RAM was not feasible anymore. It was swapping all the time. And that's the part where you see those oranges there where the system just went basically dead. Yes, it worked, but it was dead slow. There's some other stats that you can get from it, used by the data sets, used by snapshot reservations. So have a look in Munin and what Munin can provide for you in other ways. I mentioned the ZPool status there. Uh, the IO pool stats. 
There you can see the mirror, the information, and that's then where you can see there. That's a system that's writing, yes, I hope, unfortunately, over provision, that one has eight gigs for the mirror. It's only using 1.6 megabytes of data on the Zillow. The actual cache, the L2 arc, is using much more data on there. Uh, when it gets to... Yeah, right. The command there they use is uh, zbb-s, the pool. This server is a Proxmox server. You will see basically everything is already compressed, so that's the reason why there's no compression and stuff possible on there. If you look on this one, You can see there, the deduplication, there's only one that have 11% deduplication possible, and that is, uh, the reason why that is possible is because that's the one that my database backups is being done to, and my log files is written to. My compression ratio is 3 to 1, 6 to 1, and my PG logs is 10 to 1. I don't have to compress my Postgres logs, I just write them out uncompressed to disk, and at the end of the day, I do processing on them without having to decompress them or recompress them, those sort of things. It's already been done for me. Right. Snapshot management. Initially, I used cron to script my snapshots and then to delete the old ones and or uh, delete it when I'm in Aquarius disk space runs slow. But I found this uh, Z-Snap as one of the nicest ways that it already, whenever you do the snapshot, it puts a timestamp to it. You can give a name to the snapshot, a timestamp to it, as well as a TTL, how long it will survive. And then when you do the next time around, it will then say, well, yes, it needs to delete, uh, and it then deletes the old ones that way. I do have had this one experience with ZFS where the user that's other than uh, EG, oh, what is it, Postgres vacuum full, was where the one user were doing a bunch of queries that consumed lots of temporary files. And those temporary files ran over a couple of hours. And because of running over a couple of hours, uh, and every time during the snapshot time, those temp files were there, I suddenly started losing, what is it, using lots of disk space. So that's the only thing to be aware of if that sort of thing starts happening. Uh, be aware of temp files, that you don't want to have them on a snapshot directory. Right, any questions or is anybody uh, already fast asleep? Question there also. Question here. Anybody else have questions? I just want to know uh, You're now referring to the Zillow. Uh, the recovery of the Zillow. Uh, the answer to that one is. You do want to have your Zill logs always, when you do it on separate devices, mirrored in a way that you do not lose them. Now, I'm not aware of any uh, way to recover from that, other than you might only have the old data, you might not have the new data there, or the system might even be in an inconsistent state. So that's one of the reasons why you want your Zill logs to be mirrored redundant. Any other questions? Snapshots, are those done on a pool level or per directory? Okay, the question is, is the snapshot done on a pool level or per directory? Um, let me get you to the server.
Na, 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 na. Okay, uh, those are clones that I've made. What you can see here is you have your uh, data set, and that data set has a snapshot being made of. The one that you want to see is ZFS list t snapshot. Okay, so that is the actual data set, the Aquacheck web underscore DB, uh, that app, that is the name given to it. Okay, there's a reason why I use two of them for Postgres reasons. The Postgres guys will understand that, I will explain that tomorrow. Uh, but it's done per data set, or per volume. If you look at, uh, I can show you to a, uh, No, I'm not going to be able to go now then. Um, I forgot that those names. But you can also do it per block volume. You will have the same that you, will, you saw on that previous one there. Uh, what is it? Well, actually like that there. Uh, you'll see the same at sign at the back of it. It's just a volume name there. So it's per data set or per volume. Uh, ZFS's idea is everything runs as a volume, as a data set or a volume. That's the two entities it basically has uh, its snapshots on. You can do it uh, recursively. So if you have a data set with volumes underneath that, or data sets underneath that, you can then say when you do the snapshot, do it recursively, and it will apply that snapshot to all of the data sets and the volumes from that part of that hierarchy downwards. Any other questions? Quick poll, who is currently using ZFS in their networks? And after this talk, how many is going to test it out? Oops, that is not the one I want to be on. Okay, I guess like I said, thank you for you guys. Uh, that's the worst possible time for the day to do it. And we have one minute left, so enjoy the weekend. <laughs>